Hi, and happy eighth day of National Poetry Month, which means it's April 8th. And that means it's day 33 of the pandemic and I think day 16 of teaching um, under circumstances my school calls continuous learning. I think other schools call it like remote learning or virtual learning. Um, and we have Paradise Lost Book Four on deck. Rather than give you um, an epic sort of Shandian preamble like I gave last time, I think I'll just jump right into the argument. And we're gonna read from um, lines one through 357. Satan now in prospect of Eden, and nigh the place where he must now attempt the bold enterprise which he undertook alone against God and man, falls into many doubts with himself and many passions fear, envy, and despair, but at length confines himself in evil, journeys on to paradise, whose outward prospect and situation is described, overleaps the bounds, sits in the shape of a cormorant on the tree of life, as highest in the garden to look about him. The garden described, Satan's first sight of Adam and Eve, his wonder at their excellent form and happy state, but with resolution to work their fall, overhears their discourse, Thence gathers that the tree of knowledge was forbidden them to eat of under penalty of death, and thereon intends to found his temptation by seducing them to transgress, then leaves them a while to know further of their state by some other means. Meanwhile, Uriel descending on a sunbeam warns Gabriel, who had in charge the gate of paradise, that some evil spirit had escaped the deep, had passed at noon by his sphere in the shape of a good angel down to paradise discovered after by his furious gestures in the mount. Gabriel promises to find him ere morning. Night coming on, Adam and Eve discourse of going to their rest, their bower described, their evening worship. Gabriel drawing forth his bands of night watch to walk the round of paradise, appoints two strong angels to Adam's bower, lest the evil spirit should be there doing some harm to Adam or Eve sleeping. There they find him at the ear of Eve, tempting her in a dream, and bring him, though unwilling, to Gabriel, by whom questioned, he scornfully answers, prepares resistance, but hindered, a sign, hindered by a sign from heaven, flees out of paradise. Okay. Oh, for that war warning voice, which he who saw the apocalypse heard cry in heaven aloud. Then when the dragon put to second route came furious down to be revenged on men. Woe to the inhabitants of earth, that now while time was, our first parents had been warned the coming of their secret foe and escaped happily, so escaped his mortal snare. For now Satan, now first inflamed with rage, came down. The tempter ere the accuser of mankind to wreck on innocent frail man his loss of that first battle and his flight to hell. Yet not rejoicing in his speed, though bold, far off and fearless, nor with cause to boast, begins his dire attempt, which nigh the birth now rolling, boils in his tumultuous breast, and like a devilish engine back recoils upon himself. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him, for within him hell he brings, and round about him nor from hell one step no more than from it himself can fly by change of place. Now conscience wakes despair that slumbered, wakes the bitter memory of what he was, what is, and what must be worse. Of worse deeds, worse sufferings must ensue. Sometimes towards Eden, which now in his view lay pleasant, his grieved look he fixes sad. Sometimes towards heaven and the full blazing sun, which now sat high in his meridian tower, then much revolving, thus in size began. O thou, which, o thou that with surpassing glory crowned, lookest from thy sole dominion like the God of this new world, at whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads. To thee I call, but with no friendly voice, and add thy name, O son, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere, till pride and worse ambition threw me down, warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king. 
Ah, oh, wherefore? He deserved no such return from me, whom he created what I was in that bright eminence, and with his good upbraided none. Nor was his service hard. What could be less than to afford him praise, the easiest recompense, and pay him thanks? How do? Yet all his good proved ill in me, and wrought but malice. Lifted up so high, I stained subjection, and thought one step higher would set me highest, and in a moment quit the debt immense of endless gratitude, so burdensome still paying, still to owe. Forgetful what from him I still received, and understood not that a grateful mind, by owing, owes not, but still pays, at once indebted and discharged. What burden then? Oh, had his powerful destiny ordained me some inferior angel. I had stood then happy. No unbounded hope had raised ambition. Yet why not? Some other power as great might have aspired, and me, though mean and drawn to his part. But other powers as great fell not, but stand unshaken, from within or from without, to all temptations armed. Hadst thou the same free will and power to stand? Thou hadst, whom hast thou then, or what to accuse, but heaven's free love dealt equally to all? Be then his love accursed, since love or hate to me alike it deals eternal woe. Nay, cursed be thou, since against his thy will cho chose, freely, hmm, chose freely what it now so justly rues. Me miserable. Which way shall I fly, infinite wrath and infinite despair? Which way I fly is hell, myself am hell. And in the lowest deep, a lower deep still threatening to devour me opens wide, to which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. Oh, then at last relent. Is there no place left for repentance? None for pardon left? None left but by submission. And that word disdain forbids me. And my dread of shame among the spirits beneath whom I seduced with other promises and the other vaunts than to submit, boasting I could subdue the om omnipotent. I me, they little know how dearly I abide that boast so vain, under what torments inwardly I groan. While they adore me on the throne of hell, with diadem and scepter high advance, the lower still I fall. Only supreme in misery, such joy ambition finds. But say, I could repent and could obtain by act of grace my former state. How soon would Hype recall high thoughts? How soon unsay what feigned submission swore? Ease would recant vows made in pain, as violent and void. For never can true reconcilement grow where wounds of deadly hate have pierced so deep, which would but lead me to a worse relapse and heavier fall. So should I purchase dear, short intermission brought with, bought with double smart? This knows my punisher. Therefore, as far from granting he as I from begging peace, all hope excluded thus. Behold instead of us outcast, exiled, his new delight, mankind created, and for him this world. So farewell hope, and with hope, farewell fear, farewell remorse. All good to me is lost. Evil be thou my good. By thee at least, divided empire with heaven's king I hold by thee, and more than half perhaps will, re will reign, as man ere long, and this new world shall know. Thus while he spake, each passion dimmed his face, thrice changed with pale ire, envy, and despair, which marred his bor borrowed visage and betrayed him counterfeit, if any I beheld. For heavenly minds from such distempers foul are ever clear, whereof he soon aware, each perturbation smoothed with outward calm, artificer of fraud, and was the first that practiced falsehood under saintly show, deep malice to conceal, couched with revenge, yet not enough had practiced to deceive Uriel once warned, whose eye pursued him down the way he went, and on the Assyrian mount saw him disfigured, more than could befall spirit of happy sort. 
his gestures fierce, he marked and mad demeanor, then alone as he supposed, all unobserved, unseen. So on he fares, and to the border comes of Eden, where delicious paradise, now nearer, crowns with her enclosure green, as with a rural mound, the, cha the champagne head of a steep wilderness, whose hairy sides with thicket overgrown, grotesque and wild, access denied. And overhead upgrew insuperable height of lofti loftiest shade, cedar and pine and fir and branching palm, a sylvan scene, and as the ranks, ranks ascend shade above shade, a woody theater of stateliest view. Yet higher than their tops, the virtuous wall of paradise upsprung, which to our general sire gave prospect large into his nether empire neighboring round. And higher than that, wall, wall a certain, and higher than that wall, a circling row of goodliest trees loaded with fairest fruit. Blossoms and fruits at once of golden hue appeared with gay enameled colors mixed, on which the sun more glad impressed his beams than in fair evening cloud or hubid bow, when God hath showered the earth. So lovely seemed that landscape, and of pure, now purer air, meets his approach, and to the heart inspires vernal delight and joy, able to drive all sadness but despair. Now gentle gales, fanning their odiferous wings, dispense native perfumes, and whisper whence they stole the, those balmy spells. As when to them who sail beyond the Cape of Hope and now are past Mozambique, off at sea northeast winds blow Sabian odors from the spicy shore of Araby the Blessed. With such delay, With such delay, well pleased, they slack their course, and many a league cheered with the graceful smell of old ocean smiles. So entertained the, those odorous sweets, the fiend who came their bane, though with them better pleased than Asmodeus with the fishy fume that drove him, though enamored from the spouse of Tobit's son, and with a vengeance sent from Media post to Egypt, there fast bound. Now to the ascent of that steep, savage hill, Satan had journeyed on, pensive and slow. But further way found none, so thick entwined as one continued break. The undergrowth of shrubs and tangling bushes had perplexed all path of man or beast that passed that way. One gate there only was, and that looked east on the other side, which when the arch felon saw due entrance, he disdained, and in contempt, at one slight bound, high overleaped all bound of hill or highest wall, and sheer within lights on his feet. As when a prowling wolf, whom hunger drives to seek new haunt or prey, watching where shepherds pin their flocks at eve in hurdled coats amid the field secure, leaps o'er the fence with ease into the fold, or as a thief bent to unhoard the cash of some rich burger, whose substantial doors crossbarred and bolted fast, Fear no assault, in at the window climbs, or o'er the tiles. So clomb this first grand thief into God's fold. So since into his church, lewd hirelings climb. Thence up he flew, and on the tree of life, the middle tree and highest there that grew, sat like a cormorant, yet not true life thereby regained, but sat devising death to them who lived. Nor on the virtue thought, of that life-giving plant, but only used for prospect, what well used had been the pledge of immortality. So little knows, any but God alone, to value right the good before him, but perverts best things to worst abuse, or to their meanest use. Beneath him, with new wonder, now he views to all delight of human sense exposed, in narrow room, nature's whole wealth, yea, more, a heaven on earth, where blissful paradise of God the garden was, by him in the east of Eden planted. Eden stretched her line from Orion eastward to the royal towers 
of great Seleucia, built by Grecian kings, or where the sons of Eden long before dwelt in Telesar. In this pleasant soil, his far more pleasant garden God ordained. Out of the fertile ground, he caused to grow all trees of noblest kind, or sight, smell, taste. And all amid them stood the tree of life, high eminent, blooming ambrosial fruit. High eminent, mm, for blooming ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold. And next to life, our death, the tree of knowledge grew fast by. Knowledge of good brought dear by knowing ill. Southward through Eden went a river large, nor changed his course, but through the shaggy hill passed underneath engulfed. For God had thrown that mountain as his garden mold high raised upon the rapid current, which through veins of porous earth with kindly thirst updrawn rose a fresh fountain and with many a rill watered the garden. Thence united fell down the steep glade and met the nether flood, which from his darksome passage now appears, and now divided into four main streams, runs diverse, wandering many a famous realm and country whereof here needs no account, but rather to tell how, if art could tell, how from that sapphire fount the crispid brooks rolling on orient pearl and sands of gold, with mazy error, under pendant shades ran nectar, visiting each plant, and fed a flower's worth of paradise, which not nice art in beds and curious knots, but nature, boom, poured forth profuse on hill and dale and plain. But where the morning sun first warmly smote the open field, and where the unpierced shade embrowned the noontide bowers, thus was this place, a happy rural seat of various view. Groves whose rich trees wept odorous gums and balm, others whose fruit burnished with golden rind, hung amiable, Casparian fables true, if true here only, and of delicious taste. Betwixt them lawns, or level downs, and flocks grazing the tender herb were interposed, or palmy hillock, or the flowery lap of some irrigous valley spread her store, flowers of all hue, and without thorn the rose. Another side, umbrageous grots and caves of cool recess, o'er which the mantling vine lays forth her purple grape, and gently creeps luxuriant. Meanwhile, murmuring waters fall down the slope hills, dispersed, or in a lake that to the fringed bank with myrtle crowned her crystal mirror holds, unite their streams. The birds their choir apply. Airs, vernal airs, breathing the smell of field and grove, attune the trembling leaves, while universal pan knit with the graces and the hours and dance, led on the eternal spring. Not that fair field of Enna, where Proserpine gathers flowers, herself a fairer flower blight by gloomy dis was gathered, which cost Ceres all that pain to seek her through the world. Nor that sweet grove of Daphne by Orontes, and the inspired Castalian spring might with this paradise of Eden strive. Nor that Nicaean isle girt with the river Triton, where old Cam, whose Gentiles Ammon call, and Libyan Jove, hid Amalthea and her florid son, young Bacchus, from his stepdame Rhea's eyes. Nor where Abyssin kings their issue guard, Mount Amara, though this by some supposed true paradise under the Ethiop line by Nihilus's head, enclosed with shining rock, a whole day's journey high, but wide remote from this Assyrian garden, where the fiend saw undelighted all delight, all kind of living creatures new to sight and strange, two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine, the image of their glorious maker shone. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure, severe, severe but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men. Though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed, for contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace, he for God only, she for God in him, 
His fair large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule, and hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She as a veil down to the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore disheveled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet reluctant amorous delay. Nor those mysterious parts were then concealed. Then was not guilty shame, dis dishonest shame of nature's works, honor dishonorable, sin bred. How have you troubled all mankind with shows instead, mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from, life, from man's life his happiest life, simplicity and spotless innocence? So passed they naked on, nor shunned the sight of God or angel, for they thought no ill. So hand in hand they passed, the loveliest pair that ever since in love's embraces met. Adam, the goodliest of men since born his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve. Under a tuft of shade that on a green stood whispering soft, by a fresh fountain side they sat them down, and after no more toil of their sweet gardening labor than sufficed to recommend cool zephyr and made ease more easy, wholesome thirst and appetite more grateful to their supper fruits they fell. Nectarine fruits which the compliant vows yielded them sidelong as they sat reclined on the soft downy bank damasked with flowers. The savory pulp they chew and in the rind still as they thirsted scoop the brimming stream nor gentle purpose, nor endearing smiles wanted, nor youthful dalliance as beseems fair couple, linked in happy nuptial league, alone as they. About them, frisking, played all beasts of the earth, since wild, and of all chase in wood or wilderness, forest or den. Sporting, the lion ramped, and in his paw dandled the kid. Bears, tigers, ounces, pards, gambled before them. The unwieldy elephant to make them mirth used all his might and wreathed his lithe proboscis. Close the serpent sly insinuating, wove with Gordian twine his braided train and of his fatal guile gave proof unheeded. Others on the grass couched and now filled with pasture gazing sat or bedward ruminating for the sun declined, was hasting now with prone career to the ocean isles and in the ascending scale of heaven, the stars that usher evening rose. When Satan still in gaze, as first he stood, scarce thus at length failed speech recovered sad.